listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Hey, everyone, we are back for season six of the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your host, Marina Buxov, a functional medicine pharmacist and holistic herbal educator. I'll be sharing inspiring stories of my guests who have shifted into holistic modalities, both personally and professionally. My co-host, Dr. Jenna Carmichael, will be joining me to lead the Journal Club episodes to share an evidence-based approach to holistic and herbal medicine. I'm so glad you're here and hope you enjoy the show. Hello, dear listeners. I am just coming off an extended 4th of July break and hope you're all enjoying the summer so far and celebrating every occasion the season offers. One of the things I cherish most in my life is spending time with family, and one of my biggest blessings has been becoming a mother. Today, I'm interviewing a fellow holistic-minded pharmacist and mother who shares my passion and belief that we have the power and ability to change our health. We talk about feeling confident and empowered to advocate for your health choices and going beyond the conventional during one's fertility journey. Dr. Katie Wood is a mother, pharmacist, and integrative fertility coach. She is the founder of Farm to Wellness LLC and the brand Happy Nourished Motherhood. Katie helps women over 30 to nourish their mind and body for optimal fertility health so they can confidently conceive with ease. Katie comes from eight years of experience as a retail pharmacist. This background in conventional medicine is what first piqued her awareness that people need more intimate coaching towards health and vitality without depending on pharmaceuticals. After experiencing a lack of support and education through her fertility and pregnancy journey, she became determined to advocate for women's health. Katie decided to follow her feminine-led intuitive pull to switch to a home birth halfway in her pregnancy, and this was the best decision she ever made. Katie is passionate about supporting and empowering women on their fertility and pregnancy transition into motherhood using her calm, gentle guidance and taking a holistic approach focusing on nutrition, lifestyle, and mind-body connection. Without further ado, let's welcome her to the show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I have with me today a very dear and special guest. Her name is Dr. Katie Wood, and she is a pharmacist and an integrative fertility coach. So welcome to the show. Hi, Marina. Thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure. So we met through Christina Fontana and we collaborated on our recent book project together, Moving Beyond the Counter. Um, And we met in person uh, recently at the book signing. And I was also a guest on your podcast. So I'm definitely excited to get to chatting today about your journey. And I would love to start with the question I ask everybody, uh, which is really about your background, where you grew up and how you became a pharmacist. Sure. Yes. I, it was amazing meeting you in person and that book signing was just so elegant and gorgeous and the book itself. I'm just so honored to be a part of that. And it's exciting that we can be a part of it together, but yes, my background. So I grew up in New York, upstate New York. So near Syracuse, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that area and the Finger Lakes region. And yeah, I was just always a very curious kid. I love to learn. I was surrounded by, you know, woods where my house was. We lived like a quarter mile off the road and we had a pond and horses. So it was a really magical, you know, childhood for me. And I I feel like I did always have this interest in kind of like plants and natural medicine and like Native Americans was a topic that I was extremely interested in and just the fact that they used plant medicine and they knew how to do that. Um, And I knew that I wanted to do something kind of more geared towards healthcare and really try to make an impact like on people's lives. I love helping people. Um, And pharmacy at that time in high school was kind of brought up to me like I was initially thinking nutrition and um, and then I think my brother-in-law was like oh you should go into pharmacy like that's a very secure 
job market and, you know, there's a lot of places, you know, and things that you could do with a farm D. So I was like, you know what, that's a good idea. So then I, you know, I applied and I got into it at the time it was called Albany College of Pharmacy. And I graduated in 2013. I would say that, you know, when I was in college, I, you know, I think I was more focused on the fun of college than anything else, which is fine. Um, so I really just, you know, I graduated, I was already working in retail as a technician and then eventually an intern. And I, I feel like the logical next step was to just, you know, become a pharmacist within that company. And that's what I did. And, you know, I did enjoy it, but I'm sure as you know, Marina, cause you were in retail pharmacy as well. Um, you know, the terrain of pharmacy, I, I feel, so I graduated in 2013. I'm not sure what year you graduated. I was just going to say that that was the same year I graduated. Same year. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's really when pharmacy shifted. Um, a lot of things started changing. Like I remember when I walked into the pharmacy to apply for the job. So this was back in like 2008 to become a technician. The pharmacist at the, at the time was sitting down and she was reading a book. Um, you know, so she had time to do that. And that is actually the pharmacy I started off working at. And they were relatively busy, but things were so different then. I mean, we had a very old computer system. I remember we would store prescriptions on this little metal gadget thing. We'd have to pull them and go through them if we had to reference something. And, you know, they weren't giving immunizations then. I think that our class and your class included was really the first um like pharmacy year to go through the immunization training like we had that when we graduated so that's really i think when things started shifting in terms of pharmacy where you know different types of like workloads were being put on pharmacists and then you know reimbursement rates through insurance companies started kind of going downhill. So then, you know, MTMs ended up becoming a, a real big thing. And that was actually something that I was really good at and was a big focus of mine as the staff pharmacist. Um, but I feel like the more I did it, you know, the insurance companies really take the initial role on that. And they tell you what customers to call and what you want to talk to them about. And I feel like eventually I started noticing you know, I'm constantly calling these same people to tell them to take their statin medication, but they've had a thousand reasons why they can't take a statin, you know? So that's kind of what I noticed where, is this really about helping the, you know, the, the client, the customer, or is it more about just getting them to, to start and stay on this medication? So I would say, you know, the longer I was in retail, the more my eyes started opening up in terms of my own values and, you know, how I was actually showing up and being able to help my my customers because it didn't really feel like I was able to show up in the way that I initially envisioned in my mind becoming a pharmacist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. And with the last name like Wood and such a magical childhood that you described, and I see you're wearing a, a dress or a shirt, I'm not sure, with flowers, and you have some essential oils behind you and the chakra system. Um, so it's really interesting to see, you know, your experience and your embodied journey and how you know, your experience in pharmacy has led you to what you do today and, you know, how that journey unfolded. So I would love to know, um, you know, where did you start to make those shifts in your personal life and in your professional life to now be an integrated fertility coach? Sure. Yeah. So like I said, I had graduated in 2013 and my husband and I 
we were engaged before we graduated and we got married in 2015. So I feel like those first two years out of college, super focused on planning a wedding and just really getting my feet wet in terms of being a pharmacist and not just the intern. It's very different when everything falls on your shoulders and you're the one that everyone goes to for questions. So really just kind of feeling confident and secure in that. So I say all that because I think after we were married and things settled down in terms of planning for that, that's when I must have been more open to kind of seeing other things and receiving things like downloads and things like that. I actually became aware in 2016 of the fact that a lot of our makeup and beauty products can actually contain a lot of endocrine disruptors and just a lot of um, ingredients that are not good for us. So as someone who was an avid Bath and Body Works lover, this was really eye-opening for me. And that's really when I think my my own like inner journey started was in 2016. Because I feel like once you know one thing like that, you become curious and then you just keep learning more. And, and really, I think that's kind of the beauty of social media and Instagram is I ended up seeking out different profiles in terms of like the value that they were giving and the things that they were talking about. And I lear I've learned so much along the way um, and have just really been working on my own environment at home. You know, it goes all the way down to your toothpaste and even feminine hygiene products and, you know, dryer sheets. It's just so many things. Um, and then in 20, at the very end of 2017, that's when my husband and I decided that we wanted to start our family. So I had been on birth control for 13 years at that point. And this is really when my, I feel my own, you know, feminine embodiment, you know, journey really started because I think that being on birth control really just disconnects you from, you know, really the miraculous like nature and rhythm that really is our menstrual cycles and just all the things that can come with that, the different energies, the different, you know, moods and, and all those things. Um, you just don't experience that when you're on birth control. And we struggle to get pregnant. And I, you know, at the time, I really thought that I was healthy and and really I was healthy compared to, you know, most Americans. But I still think that there was now looking back, there was definitely room for improvement there for sure. And we struggled to get pregnant and it took us 10 months, which for some that doesn't sound like a long time, but it certainly was for us, you know, we had had a fertility specialist appointment set up at that one year mark. And um, I was fortunate to be able to cancel it. But I had, you know, I had reached out to my OB um, that I had initially on this journey. And, you know, she really didn't give me much advice. It was just, oh, your cycles are regular. You're healthy, you know, just keep trying. But there was really no nutritional advice, lifestyle advice, you know, anything that I could do to possibly improve my chances, you know, of conceiving. So, of course, as a pharmacist, you know, I was doing tons and tons of research and admittedly driving myself a little crazy, just trying to do all the things, taking all the supplements. Um, and then I came across acupuncture and that that could help fertility. And I had never done acupuncture before. But um, I was so fortunate to have found um, an acupuncturist in Ithaca, and he was so knowledgeable, and he really, really helped me heal my body. I think a lot of it from the birth control is what he thought. Um, so, you know, we used a lot of modalities like the acupuncture, Chinese herbs, you know, we used some moxie, gua sha, and really helped kind of rebuild my blood, get rid of that stagnation, get it flowing more. You know, I have a cold, cooler constitution. So just trying to focus on warming foods, keeping my body warm, because it was 
when I was seeing him, it was like April through um, August. So, I mean, being in the pharmacy, there's air conditioning on, you know, I would be freezing and that, that can just really take a toll on, on your body. And, you know, I think it ended up being four months later, I ended up getting pregnant after working with him. And I truly feel that everything that we worked on together really helped my body get to that point to feel safe and feel able to carry a healthy pregnancy. So that was definitely uh, an amazing experience that I was able to have. Yeah, absolutely. So much wisdom and pearls that you dropped into that story and you weaved in so beautifully. I just want to reflect back that, you know, it's just peeling back the layers, like you were saying, once you become aware of one thing, you start to see like, okay, there's this, but then you it leads you down sometimes a rabbit hole, like, okay, but there's also that. And then each time that you kind of progress to each level, it informs you and makes you become a little bit more aware of, you know, the big picture and what's going on. So for you, it started with the personal care items and recognizing that some of those things are toxic. And like you said, as a pharmacist, you're able to see the ingredients and to interpret that data and then look at the literature and the research. Um, now there's like those apps, like the environmental working group, which you can mm -hmm. check out and you can see what products you're using in your home. And even things that we think, you know, are like spiritual, like candles or incense. Some of those contain toxins and fragrances. And especially when upon combustion, it, it could really disrupt, you know, the air quality in your home. And, you know, then we, we talk about mold and other things. And, I think it's just a lot, right? And it can overwhelm people, but that's why sometimes it's good to just peel back layer by layer and then just start with one product or one category and then slowly understand how can you improve, you know, this one little area and it can trickle down really in in really amazing ways and uh, almost like a, an avalanche effect, but in a good way where, you know, you can really by adding in all these little pieces, you can actually start to create a better foundation of health and awareness. And I also want to point out like that feeling of safety, that pregnancy, you know, is a very stressful time on the body. You're not only caring for your own body, but you're building a brand new body, right? So often we have like this unrealistic expectation of our body that, oh, we should just be able to, you know, go and get pregnant, no problem. But it requires for our body to feel safe and stable. You know, we also probably, most of us are mindful of like a stable home and finances and things like that when bringing another human on board. And the same thing goes for your body. Like you need to give your body the building blocks that it needs for not only your body, but this new human. And your body will always prioritize your body. Maybe for you, the human is priority, but your body wants to make sure that you make it to the end of the pregnancy and the new human makes it, right? So it will always uh, shift focus back and forth and make sure that, you know, there's a healthy pregnancy, a healthy child, and then a healthy body that's carrying the child. So um, it needs that foundation of feeling safe and secure to carry out its own, you know, foundational tasks. And also this new job, this very, very big, important job that you know, we think, oh yeah, no, we should just be able to <laughs> pop out babies. But the reality is, even though we're living in an age where so many things are, and advances are at our fingertips, the modern lifestyle, you know, we've forgotten how to actually slow down and nourish our bodies and feel safe and deal with stress. Because even though there's much advancement in healthcare and all the other fields and technology and life is in a way easier for us than our ancestors, we have the perception of stress just bombarding us. And then we have the environmental toxicity, which is a huge burden. Um, and the last thing I want to say before we move on is, um, you know, the idea of the Eastern medicine and the constitutional um, medicine that you were mentioning about understanding what is 
the energetic type of your body and how do we support the individual body that's in front of us. And, uh, you know, the idea of cold and hot, you know, and temperature, we often say it's an old wives tale, right? That, oh, you catch a cold because it's cold. Or sometimes we also say in my culture that, you know, you almost freeze your womb or your ovaries. So we say, do not sit on cold surfaces, you know, for women and even like cold plunges sometimes are not recommended. So, um, it's considered an old wives tale because we know about germ theory, but there's also terrain theory. So if your body just like can't handle those extremes, um, it just needs to be supported in a different way. Not everybody is built the same and we need to understand what resources each individual body needs. Yeah. I love, um, the way you explain that. That's totally true. And we're all unique and individual and and yeah, if our body is not feeling supported in that way, then absolutely. So how did your individual and personal health journey with everything that you shared, um, how did that play into you now becoming a fertility coach? Yeah, so, you know, going through the, you know, what I perceived as fertility struggles, I definitely think was necessary for me to go through. And I'm thankful, actually, that it didn't just happen right away, because it's very clear that my body needed some healing. And I think also mentally and emotionally preparing to also have a child, too. So I think that and this is what I, you know, try to preach to my fertility community is to embrace the journey and that it's really there to help support you and to help you grow. Like, I really think that at the end of the day, that was a spiritual awakening for me and allowing me to kind of step into that next version of myself. So when we did get pregnant, you know, I got my first pregnancy test in the very beginning of September. I I think I was even doing research for pregnancy before I actually got pregnant. Um, there's a book, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's amazing. It's Real Food for Pregnancy by Lily Nichols. Absolutely amazing. It has so much good information, but I really did a lot of research as well throughout my pregnancy. I did a birthing course online and it gave such a beautiful um, explanation of all the possibilities of birth and really preparing you for that. And my husband and I decided halfway in my pregnancy that we wanted to have a home birth. So that required a lot of thought and, you know, careful thought and intention and, you know, connecting with a midwife that we aligned with. And luckily we were able to do that based off of the doula that I hired really helped kind of put all of this in motion because, you know, I'm a big believer of things happening for a reason. And I had thought about a home birth, but we live 30 minutes away from the closest hospital, like minimum 30 minutes. So we just decided like, no, that we can't do that. And we hired this woman or we met her to like interview her, the doula. And she happens to live in the same small town that we live in. Like you just, it's one of those towns that you drive through, like on, we live on like a state route. And she had just recently had a home birth living in the same town. So that really gave me the confidence that, you know, we could do it too. So, and then she had a midwife to recommend to us and she ended up being so amazing. And we we decided to do it and it ended up being the best decision that I think I've ever made in my life, having that experience and really preparing for it as well. Um, so I say all of this because a lot of research was done. A lot of, you know, inner growth was done. I think going through birth period, let alone it's in a hospital, um, at your home or in a birthing center, like that in of itself is such a transformative experience. Like I truly believe that not only is a, a child born, but like the mother is also reborn. 
So I, you know, I mention all of this because I think, and I know in my heart that this is really what changed things for me. You know, I ended up being at a point where it was hard to even counsel people on things that they could take over the counter because a lot of what the pharmacy carries are not things that I would even take for myself. So, you know, once I became a mom, I became more aware of children's needs and things like that. And I I just remember so vividly someone asking for a recommendation for a child's vitamin. And I'm literally just like looking at all of them on the shelf and they all have high fructose corn syrup. They're all coated in sugar. I mean, they're already in gummy form as it is. And it's just like, I I can't, I can't recommend this. So it really just kind of became, um, you know, I guess ethically very difficult to kind of move through the retail space and, you know, just refilling someone's diabetes medication when I know that if they made some nutrition and lifestyle modifications that they could absolutely reverse their type two diabetes. Um, so that's, yeah, I feel like those things just started happening more like cumulatively after I went through the whole fertility and motherhood experience. And then, you know, just looking back at what I did go through and, and before I switched over to the midwife, um, the home birth midwife, there was also no education on prenatal nutrition. I mean, it's wild to me because there's so much that we could do as moms to better our health, better our child's health. And I know, you know, Marina, you have two children. Um, There's so many things we could do that could start our children off the right foot and reduce their risk for so many things and, you know, help prevent pregnancy complications like preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and there's just not education being given to women. You know, she had told me, or, or the the nutrition education that I got was basically things that I can't eat. And then also, if I really wanted to eat deli meat, I just need to microwave it first, which is disgusting. Um, and And then she had said to me, you know, if you don't gain enough weight by the end of your pregnancy, we'll just have you like eat a lot of uh milkshakes or something like that and i'm just like (laughs) okay um so you know just before we even made the switch to the home birth midwife a lot of red flags were coming up for me you know i had done my research especially with the um you know the glucola drink the like blood sugar test and i told her i said i'm not going to take that But alternatively, I will happily wear a continuous glucose monitor for you, which really at the end of the day, that gives you so much like better of a picture in terms of like someone's glucose control. And she looked at me like I had 10 heads. Um, I remember when I first went to the office, I was like, I want my vitamin D checked. Also was told like, well, we don't routinely check for that. You know, why do we not do that? Vitamin D is so important for pregnancy and also when you're breastfeeding too. Um, So all this to say, I think it just really opened my eyes to not only what I was seeing working behind the counter, but actually being a patient Um, and then just realizing the lack of education and support. So I knew that I wanted to fill those gaps for women and really help them feel confident and empowered because, you know, having that confidence to advocate for your health, had I not had that confidence for myself, I wouldn't have been able to show up to those doctor's appointments and, you know, tell them what my needs are and and all of that. Yeah, definitely. So much of what you're saying really resonates. And, you know, I think pregnancy and having small children is a time where we start to be become more aware and recognize, you know, how can we support our children, right? Because sometimes it's hard to worry as much about your own health or, you know, self-care 
versus understanding that you're now caring for your child, you know, another human being, an individual, and that makes you even more cognizant, you know, and more cautious and more, um, you know, more and more people are wanting to do this in a more natural and supportive way and establishing the foundations. And it's so interesting to me because something that's good for our baby is also good for adults. And we, we, we kind of don't understand that we're like, okay, we'll care for the baby. And then when the baby grows up, you know, it's okay. Like they could start having all this toxic stuff. And the the problem is that, yes, we can handle more toxins as our body ages, right? Um, as we grow just larger in mass and because we have storage, you know, in our fat. And so there are ways that your body tries to protect you by storing it in fat. So it's not all over in your bloodstream, but it's, it's still not healthy. It's still a good idea to reduce our toxic burden and our allostatic load so that we can, you know, not just survive, but thrive, right? So mm -hmm. everything that you're intentionally doing good for the baby, like including avoiding microwaves, right? We, we don't usually typically recommend microwaving food or like, you know, whatever we're introducing the baby to, right? Intuitively, it's also good for us. We just oh, it's okay, we can handle it, right? Um, so that's pretty interesting. And as long as it's an intentional choice, I'm not saying you have to be saints that we never like, you know, let's say eat fried foods or do something that is not 100% healthy or good for us, but we need to be aware and we need to strive for a sort of balance, like and the 80-20 rule, for example, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, just be conscious of like, this is an activity that is good and nourishing for me. So I'm going to prioritize it, but you know, I have my cheat days and I'm fine with that. So, um, so yeah, I think this is like a huge area that people are wanting more support and education in. And this is the only area in healthcare where it's like, there's nothing wrong with people who are pregnant, but we're still called patients and we still, you know, get care in the hospital with a bunch of sick people, even though it's a natural process to be pregnant and to give birth, it's not actually like a disease state. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, we, we do go through the healthcare system um, from a lens of like, Oh, what's, what's wrong. What can possibly go wrong? Let's, let's see what's wrong wrong and like the focus on what's wrong and all of these things versus trying to focus on okay what's right how can we support what's going right and I you know I'm grateful again for the modern interventions and c-sections and hospitals and doctors and surgeons and medicine of course but also we could be doing like you said a lot on the preventative and supportive side so that there's less of a risk for the acute care scenario to pop up so that, you know, we, we lower our chances of group B strep, you know, by eating the right foods and ferments and probiotics. And people are just not aware of that. And the doctors, unfortunately, are not recommending those things and, and, and all the other tips that you mentioned. So, you know, um, I guess my question for you would be like, what really tipped you over the edge and had you go and switch over to a home birth and uh, a midwife? Because, you know, there is that fear monkey mind and also society. And I know this for myself when I chose um, twice to give um, birth in a, in a birth center, but natural and drugless birth, mm -hmm. um, people were like, what do you mean? What about what if something goes wrong? How could you be so responsible? And, you know, all of those fears come up. So how did you handle that? Yeah, it was definitely a decision. Um, my husband initially was a little reluctant in the beginning. Had there been a birth center nearby, he probably would have pushed for that. Um, but he loved the whole experience um, at that, you know, all said and done. I think I had really just tuned into my body and what felt right to me. And I can almost feel my body feel um, very constricted with just the thought of walking into a hospital with all of the lights, lots of people around trying to hook me up to things. And I, I don't have any hospital trauma or anything like that. So it's not like PTSD coming up. It's just me kind of, I think, tapping into our primal nature. I just knew that 
my body would just probably completely shut down and stop the laboring process. And it, it even happened at our house. I was progressing pretty good. And then our moms came um, and they really were just downstairs for the majority of it, but they came in and said, hi. And my midwife, I think probably after the fact ended up commenting that, yes, you, your labor really kind of slowed down after they walked into the room. Um, so I can only imagine like what would have happened if I was in a hospital, just kind of being bombarded with uh, all the things really. So I think it was just trusting that intuition and the birthing course that I did. It's a mama natural course. It, they just outlined all of the things so beautifully that I was able to feel confident in that decision. And I knew, you know, they say the first intervention is like the moment you walk into the hospital. I just knew that um, that wasn't for me. And we, you know, we did do our due diligence. We visited two hospitals, um, Cortland and Ithaca, just in case we did need to have a transfer so we could pick which one really kind of aligned with us. So we did have that as like the backup plan. And and when I interviewed, I joke about it, but it's true. When we interviewed the midwife, I had like three pages of questions and I went through all of them. She was able to answer all of them. And yeah, I think it was just feeling confident in my intuition, which fortunately I was able to kind of tap into that. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it's a matter of like, we just don't know what we don't know. So if everybody around you is, you know, going to the hospital and you're not even aware that services like midwives or doulas or birthing centers are out there and could potentially be in your community, you just uh, would never find that out because all you know is what's around you. So I love that there's, you know, resources that you have been mentioning. I follow Natural Mama, you know, and so they're educating the public. I even got her affirmation oracle cards. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're out anymore, but back when she sold them, I got myself a pack. That's when I was pregnant with my first child. And um, yeah, she has a lots of great references and they are, you know, uh, sort of balance with evidence as well and studies. And I got her book, you know, with the week by week pregnancy guide, um, you know, and, and there were also some resources in the community. And I also had a doula. Um, also, even just watching documentaries, the business of being born or um, mm. spiritual midwifery, the book, and then there's also a documentary with Ida Mee Gaskin. So those were some of like how I prepared for pregnancy and how I got to see, you know, what else is out there. And it really got me to consider that, you know, naturally, like you were saying, we want to be kind of a, like aligned and in tune with ourselves and we need that space and we need that um, feeling of being like primal and alone this is like an initiation like you said you know the mother is born just as much as the child is born and uh, the body does know what to do we just need to let it and sometimes like our head you know and thinking and the fears can actually stress us out and not allow the body to take over and do what it needs to do. Um, so, so if you see animals, like they're always, you know, finding an isolated dark corner and they don't have, you know, doctors um, when they're not forced into positions that are actually not conducive to labor progression. And like you said, you know, as soon as one intervention happens, that's the more likely that the whole cascade of them will happen, unfortunately. So, um, you know, I believe there will be a way to to become more integrated in the care that we are providing. Um, hopefully that that's where our model is going. But I definitely hear you on, you know, just not wanting to go there and, you know, be viewed as sick and a patient and having the whole downward spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also found her week by week, uh, Mama Natural's week by week book, very informational. And I think reading her book is actually where I decided like, yes, I'm going to hire a doula. So again, I think things happen for a reason. I read her book, led me to hire the doula, which brought me to the midwife. And, and, you know, if some of those things didn't happen, maybe I wouldn't be where I am today. You know, it's hard to say, but 
that book was definitely helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank you so much for, you know, wonderful conversation and sharing your story. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about how you moved into your business and how you work with clients now. Yeah. So let's see, it was January of 2021. I started going to IIN, the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, and I did their accelerated program. So I got my health coaching certificate in August of 2021. And that's the same month that I started my business, Farm to Wellness. And, you know, for that fall, it was really a lot of kind of exploration. What do I want to do? I knew I wanted it to be somewhat geared towards like the motherhood journey. And um, I ended up really deciding on focusing on fertility because, you know, without a healthy fertility, there is no pregnancy or postpartum. So, and I feel like that that's a space where women do really, really need a lot of support because, you know, I felt very isolated and lonely and like something was wrong with me on my journey. So just really um, being like a beacon of support for them. and. And then what's beautiful about it is the lifestyle and nutrition changes that you make on your, you know, fertility journey, they hopefully and ideally will stay with you on your pregnancy and your postpartum journey. So I had my first fertility uh, client in January of, yeah, I guess that'd be 2022. So I'm coming down to the end of my first real, you know, year in business. And it's been a wild ride. I mean, the development I've had personally and professionally has been absolutely insane. Um, and I've been able to support women in a lot of different ways. I have my free Facebook group where I try to share daily tips, either on things that you can do for your nutrition, definitely stress management, supplements, and I coach women one-on-one. -on -one. I have, you know, some longer packages really for someone who needs kind of a lot more personal support on their journey. And if someone isn't ready for that, I do have like a very uh, short one-month package to kind of coach people, kind of get them like a head start on their I have created a group coaching program because at the end of the day, I'm only one person. And in terms of helping women one-on-one, -on -one, I can only, I can only help so many in one month. So the group coaching is really, really nice because they're still getting all of the beautiful information that I share with my one-on-ones. And then on top of that, they have the community of women and um, it's just a really nice space to have. And it kind of, frees up more time for me to be able to be with my family and my daughter because um, we have decided we are going to homeschool her, which is really another exciting kind of like next step in this crazy journey life that I'm on right now. You know, if you asked me five years ago, if I would have had a home birth and be homeschooling my children, I would say no. But um, yeah, it's it's been a crazy, a crazy year and just so fulfilling being able to get messages like I'm pregnant and, you know, I have a, um, a woman in my group coaching program right now. And she, you know, definitely has PCOS like tendencies and she never expected to be able to get pregnant and she's pregnant right now. And she's just like, I'm just so thankful that I was able to find you. And it's just, it's so fulfilling. And I am so happy to be able to make an a difference in these women's lives, but then also their children too. I mean, that's really what I'm here for. And I like to call it, you know, it's generational change because what you're doing right now is going to have a ripple effect on your children and your children's children. So I'm pretty lucky to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a concept that IIN teaches on. I'm also a fellow graduate. And uh, you're turning into like a crunchy pharmacist. <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I'm already there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Love it. I'm also like following the crunchy moms groups and, and things like that. So um, I considered homeschooling, but I don't think it's for me <laughs> personally at this point in my life. But I really respect that. And um, before I let you go, Katie, do you mind doing a rapid fire series of questions? 
Oh man, sure. I'll try. (laughs) All right. Um, What would be your number one advice to somebody struggling right now with fertility or thinking that there's something wrong with them? Definitely to seek support and community and you're not alone and you're, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. Love it. And I think that's applicable to any condition, the human condition in general, and something we can all use as a daily gentle reminder to ourselves. Um, Question number two, what is something people may find surprising about you? Oh, man. Um, Surprising. Hmm. I don't know. I, I love to garden, but I don't know if that would be surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I love lifting weights. I love weightlifting. It's like really, I, I just feel really, really good after doing it. So I'm sure some people probably don't think that about me. <laughs> yeah, I, I would find that second one surprising, actually, because you usually associate weight, weightlifting with like bodybuilders and muscles and you to me are the you know feminine embodiment. So that's really cool. Um, OK, question number three is what is your favorite thing to cook or eat? Or let's let's make it fun. What's your favorite fertility food? <laughs> Oh, avocados for sure. I could eat avocado toast every single day and I almost do. It's just a matter (laughs) of if the avocado is ripe or not. Awesome. Yeah. Sometimes you can get a good one and then other times it's not, it's not so good. Um, Okay. Awesome. So my last question to you is how can people learn more about your work and how can they support what you're doing? I love that one. Great. So Honestly, the easiest place to go to, which would have everything on there because I just updated it, is happynourishedmotherhood.com. You'll be able to find my Instagram, my free Facebook group. I have a lot of free offerings on there. Um, I have different ways that you can kind of shop with things that are ready to go um, as well. And you can kind of learn a little bit Um, more about me on there and then also how I can help you either with fertility, pregnancy, postpartum, or just general women's health as well. Awesome. Well, I'll have all those links in the show notes so you can all check them out. And last thing I want to say is you're also offering a beautiful gift. So could you just tell us what that is? Yes. So I have a womb meditation, which is actually the first meditation that I created for my group coaching program. It's short and sweet, but I can tell you it brought one of my one-on-one clients to tears. And she explained that it was a very potent uh, meditation. It really just kind of helps connect you back to your womb, your heart and your womb together. And just knowing that, you know, fertility isn't meant to or conception isn't meant to happen overnight it's a very miraculous experience and your body has you know so much wisdom you know if you don't get pregnant that month it may be for a reason you know maybe the egg just wasn't the best quality or you know a ton of different things could be happening but your body is very, very smart and it knows when, you know, the right time to choose the right sperm and the right egg. So it'll happen all in divine timing. I love that so much. And I could just tell that you're pouring so much love and care into the work that you are putting out into the world. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for this interview. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Marina. You too. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I truly hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed creating it. If you learned something new from it, I'd love if you could leave us a five-star review and share it with a friend who might love it too. You can find me on any of the podcast and social media platforms by looking up Holistic Pharmacist or Dr. Marina Booksov. Thank you for your support and see you next time.